Hi, I'm Keith Code. We hear lots of advice about how to ride. Some of it's destructive advice, some friendly advice, and some useful tips. Let's see how advice stacks up against the technology of riding. Take how to steer as an example. Most often, our first vehicle had three wheels, like this tricycle. Turn the bars to the right, and it goes right. Turn to the left, and it goes left. Simple. Our first ventures out on two wheels usually involved training wheels. Now we have a four-wheeler. From the tricycle experiences, we instinctively turn right to go right, and it works. In the time-honoured method of training, we raise the training wheels. Now we have a recipe for disaster. We've lost two wheels. It's now a frighteningly unstable machine. The child expects it to steer like everything else she's ridden. Look what happens though. She steers to the right and the bike tips over to the left, just like all two-wheeled devices. Even with all the bad advice, out of our sense of survival, we somehow make it work. But do we understand the underlying technology of it? All two-wheeled vehicles steer differently to three- and four-wheelers. To go right, you apply pressure to the right handlebar. That action initiates the turn. The bike then leans over and the front wheel turns into the turn. It's called counter-steering. That's why training wheels are so confusing at first. It's counter to everything the child has learned. Good job. Listen, I've grafted an extra set of bars on this bike. The whole idea was to take the handlebars out of the equation to discover what so-called body steering really does. The extra throttle on the top bars allows the rider to maintain his speed. Even with massive shifts in body weight without any input through the handlebars, the bike only vaguely changes direction. This would never get you through the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. Foot peg weighting is another myth. Even with his entire body weight on one peg, this bike merely veers off course, and once his course is set, the pressure has even less effect. Good advice doesn't always put the rider in real control and can prevent us from properly being able to do this. A little counter steering with bar pressure gets the job done and puts the rider in control. Here, we have mounted a simple pointer on the tank to illustrate counter steering. Let's take it for a ride and see what happens. See how the pointer shows the bars moving first to the left and then right, and vice versa? This is counter steering. It's the only way to accurately steer a motorcycle. It really is simple. Just press on the bar and the bike responds instantly. That's all you do, and it works all the time, every time, even with only one finger. The idea that we lean to steer comes from the fact that when you lean right, you unconsciously pressure the right handlebar, and that counter steers the bike right. Vice versa for left turns. Lean steering is one of the myths of riding. Some believe body steering works because they can manoeuvre the bike with their hands off the bars. When we move our weight around on the bike, it actually creates a counter steering action. Look at the pointer. Some riders are confused about how they steer a bike once they are in a turn. It's exactly the same. To tighten the turn, you press your inside bar. To widen your turn and bring the bike up, you press the outside bar. Counter steering always works. Counter steering is a piece of riding tech that will help you to improve your control in virtually every situation. But sometimes the cutting edge cuts the rider. What's needed is the riding technology to match the machine's technology. After over a century of development, motorcycles are truly precision cornering machines. But that doesn't eliminate rider error. What stops most riders from being able to use all of that potential?
It's an agreed upon fact. Our instinctive survival reactions, our SRs, ruin a rider's hopes of being confident and in control. In riding, there are eight distinct so-called survival reactions, or SRs, and we can see all of them in this one incident. Immediately, we see the rider trying to use body steering into the turn when he should have counter-steered, so he starts out a little wide. If you'd known how to steer the bike, this whole thing could have been avoided. Let's get back and see what other errors were made. He gets on the gas to stabilise the bike, but chops it mid-turn. The bike stands up a bit, and that's SR number one, chopping the gas from panic. Now he's counter-leaning against the angle of the bike. This increases bike lean angle, but doesn't tighten up the turn as he had hoped. This is another SR. Now the bike is unstable and running wide, so he tightens his grip on the bars. Our most common SR. None of this helped. He's running wide and panics. He's looking everywhere but where he should be around the turn. This is visual panic. He target locks on the very thing he doesn't want to hit. An SR? You bet. In a panic, we go where we look. He's steering directly towards the log where his attention is locked. SR number six. With his attention tunnelling down, he cannot steer effectively and becomes frozen on the bars. Yes, SR number seven. He can't turn, so he jumps on the brakes our eighth SR. His lazy steering started the whole mess, but when he chopped the throttle off, it got worse. First, let's take a look at throttle control and how it works. Considering that most machines in a static or constant speed situation have roughly 50-50 weight distribution, we can begin to calculate the guidelines for correct throttle control through a turn. The fact the rear contact patch is the larger of the two tells the story. Give me more weight, I can handle it. So, once in the corner, our task is to shift 10 to 20% more load to the rear to give it its fair share of load. This we do with the throttle. Technically speaking, we want a slight 0.1 to 0.2 Gs of acceleration to accomplish that. Simply put, in a straight line, it's the force generated by a smooth fifth gear roll-on in the four to 6,000 RPM range on pretty much anything over 600 cc. That's not much acceleration, but it transfers the weight. Whatever the RPM range, we must maintain the weight transfer by continuing our throttle roll-on. Throttle control rule number one. Once the throttle is cracked open, it is rolled on evenly, smoothly and continuously throughout the remainder of the turn. This is not just a racing technique. It applies to all corners on all motorcycles. Once the correct transfer of weight is achieved using the throttle, any big changes in that weight distribution will reduce available traction, which is especially important in poor traction conditions. Once the bike is fully leaned over, violating rule number one with poor throttle control will underweight or overweight that particular tyre bike combination. Here again, even in poor traction conditions, good throttle control gives maximum stability and grip. Slides aren't the only negative result from rolling the throttle on and off. For track riding and racing, each throttle on off or even just a hesitation will cost you time. At least a tenth of a second, about a bike length, in a slow to medium speed turn. In higher speed turns, the same throttle error will cost you even more. The effects of wind drag are substantial at higher speeds. This rider is late on the gas and gets very hard sudden acceleration out of the turn. 
This rider is trying for good throttle control and has nice clean roll on. Not the same fierce acceleration as the first guy. But what is the actual result in exit speed? Let's look at the radar. A huge difference. There are two circumstances under which you may violate throttle control rule number one. Let's take the point where you are bringing the bike up for the drive out of the corner as the first one. As the bike is brought up towards vertical, we can be more aggressive with the throttle. At some point, you can pin it. Coordinating your throttle roll-on with bringing up the bike is how to maximize your drive off of any corner on any size bike. Most riders wait until the bike is nearly upright before they increase the roll-on rate. The skill of it is an accurate timing of the pickup and roll-on. What difference does it make? Quite a lot. The second exception to throttle control rule number one is traction control. Riders can be far more aggressive with mid-corner and exit throttle. Double apex turns are the other exception to the throttle control rule. Since you're actually dealing with two turns, it's okay to roll off or stop the roll on between the two. Good handling means predictable traction, and good traction depends on your suspension working well. In mid-corner, on a properly set up bike, the forks and shock work best in roughly their mid-stroke range. With good throttle control, you can see the forks working in their mid-stroke in mid-corner. Is that as good as it gets? Is the bike happy? Are you happy when the bike is happy? Yes, yes, and yes. In what range do we want the rear shock to operate? In the middle, of course. That's its most compliant range. That's its sweet spot, just like the forks. Once you get back on the throttle, weight begins to transfer to the rear. The rear shock becomes our main concern because we must now rely on it more for stability and traction. Contrary to popular opinion, getting on the gas hard makes the back of the bike rise. That applies to both chain and shaft drive bikes. As it rises, the rear suspension becomes stiff. This results in the rear tyre not being able to follow the road's surface as well, and traction is reduced. This becomes abundantly clear when we look at front wheel speed compared to rear wheel speed on a straight. There is quite a bit of tyre slippage, and look at the rear suspension's position. Nearly topped out. Again, it isn't working well. With good throttle control, we get what the bike is designed to deliver. Working suspension and optimum traction. Another downside of survival reaction number one, chopping the throttle, is reduced ground clearance. Not only does the front compress, so does the rear, which further reduces your clearance. Our new riders might have grasped the idea of good throttle control, but they certainly haven't mastered it yet. Your forks, shock, and suspension settings create the potential for good handling. Your throttle control brings that potential into reality. Good throttle control has a major impact on slides. In controlled slides like these, good throttle control maintains stability. In unwanted or unexpected slides, chopping it makes it worse. Watch this. Good throttle control in reverse can save you from the high side. His smooth roll-off works much better. Practice your roll-off as often as your roll-on. When the time comes, it could make all the difference. Without getting into anything really nasty, like oil on the road, what are the usual conditions that activate our off-the-gas SRs? How about some of these? Water and sand are two big concerns for most riders. While you must not be aggressive with the throttle in situations like this, you certainly don't want to chop it either. What is your best bet if it's really slippery? Well, pick it up as best you can. The less lean angle, the better.
There are many factors that affect what line a rider may take through a turn, and we'll explore that later. The point we want to make now is this. No matter what line you take, high, low, middle, whatever, good throttle control is the gauge by which you can judge it. Riders are often confused about why the bike initially stands up and runs wide when they get off the gas mid-turn. Once into your lean and the gas is rolled off, weight transfers to the front of the bike compressing the forks. That weight goes to the front tyre and spreads out the contact patch. This creates additional drag on the patch to the inside of the centre line of the bike. That drag counter steers the bike upwards and it runs wide. The whole thing can seem confusing, especially as the rider expects to tighten the turn when he rolls off the gas, and he finds the opposite of that happening. A moment later, since the gas is off, the bike slows, leans further over, and finally tightens up the turn. Applying brakes mid-corner creates the same effect. When the weight transfers forward, the result is the same. The bike stands up. A static throttle slows the bike as well. Again, the bike tends to run wide. This effect is even more pronounced at higher speeds and steeper lean angles. Getting on the gas too hard too soon will also send the bike offline, wide. Getting on the throttle too slowly makes the bike feel unresponsive. As we see here, with good throttle control, the bike looks and feels stable on its line and leaves the corner faster. Getting the feel for how much throttle the bike wants and needs to be stable and have good traction and hold its line is the art of good throttle control. There are choices in lines, but the good ones follow the throttle control rule. Let's look at all six of the off the gas results and see why it's so important to follow the throttle control rule and get back to the gas as soon as possible once the bike is turned. Weight transfers forward, changing our available traction. We've lost our suspension's mid-stroke sweet spot. The bike will tend to overreact to rough pavement and can become a bit twitchy. By creating some instability, the bike initially tends to run wide. As we saw before, we lose ground clearance on both ends of the bike. And lastly, the bike slows down. These are the six results you get from waiting too long to get back on the throttle. Getting back on the gas as early as possible solves all of these. The bike becomes planted and predictable, but can you get on the gas too early? This rider got greedy with the throttle way too early, but the solution was correct. Roll off, reduce speed, repoint the bike, and then roll back on. To add lean and throttle at this point of the turn is a common cause of crashes. But this is the way it really should be done. Charging your turns just masks your sense of speed. Let's take a look. Charging any turn tends to narrow our field of view. When we lose our reference points, it affects our sense of speed. This is one of our SRs. Our new rider is still charging corners and chopping the gas. That will cost him turn entry speed and a clean early roll on. This looks pretty rough. Even in slow speed situations, the throttle is our friend. Nothing else will stabilize the bike. Once you've mastered your throttle control SRs, you have taken a giant step towards control over the bike and confidence in yourself at any speed.
Understanding your bike's needs and wants is important. You don't have to be world champion to see. Throttle control optimizes your bike's suspension, smooths out rough surfaces, helps you hold your line, and optimizes traction in practically every situation. Let's take a close look at how excess rider input creates instability and tires out the rider. Here again, holding on too tight causes the rider to receive too much input. The tighter you hold on, the bigger the bumps seem. Small shakes from the front end are amplified as well. Why are the bars moving? What are they searching for? They're trying to find a position that will stabilise the bike by maintaining the correct tracking of front and rear wheels. The bike does this without any help from the rider. If the rider could hold on tight enough to stop the bars moving, he would only amplify that wobble. The force he puts into the bars creates resistance and a ploughing effect at the front tyre's contact patch. Now the back of the bike wants to rotate around that resistance and the wobble becomes even worse. Setting a wheelie down crooked is an extreme example of this. Let's look again. When the front wheel is not in alignment with the bike's direction of travel, there is a huge resistance created at the front contact patch. The wheel immediately tries to realign itself with the bike's direction of travel. Take a look at the massive deformation in the front tyre as it sets down. When the rubber springs back into alignment, the front end shakes. Look at the difference in front end shake the rider is creating when he is too tight on the bars. Being stable on the bike but loose on the bars reduces bike twitch. Holding on too tight transfers engine and road vibration to your hands and arms, tiring them out and making them numb. This in turn causes you to hold on even tighter. This same elevated level of feedback can, again, easily distort your sense of speed. When the rider responds by tightening up on the bars, it gets worse. This is SR number two once again, tightening on the bars. Over poor surface conditions, a rider who tenses his back gets out of harmony with his bike and will tend to bounce in the saddle. This causes extra suspension action. Your legs are a terrific help to your bike suspension in these situations. Riding light in the saddle using your legs with a loose and slightly arched back helps enormously. Most riders become anxious about being blown around by other vehicles or the wind and tighten on the bars. As the upper body is buffeted by the wind, the bike is being steered by the wind. Ride loose like this and the wind's effect on the bike is reduced. Other key rider jobs are similarly affected by holding on too tight. Being stiff on the bike while riding through bumpy turns tends to turn the throttle on and off. Suspension and traction are affected because good throttle control is not maintained. Riding loose solves this. Riding rigidly can shake your helmet and blur your vision. The more you try to brace yourself and hold your head still, the more it shakes. This can even make your neck sore. Limber and loose is smooth. Do you ever find yourself making steering corrections while in the corner? This is another part of survival reaction number two, gripping the bars too tightly. As the bike runs wide, or feels like it's running wide, survival reaction number two kicks in and steering corrections occur. This all makes the bike more unstable and it runs wide in the corner. How much actual bar pressure is needed to hold your line? As you can see, with good throttle control, none. Like most avid cornering enthusiasts, you've tried to hang off. There are several key elements we'll cover on this. First, when do you hang off? 
one of the more common beginner errors is moving over into a hang-off position right at the turning point. Notice the bike wiggling? The rule of thumb is to pre-position your hips just before you roll off the gas. This method will reduce problems from unwanted handlebar and body inputs. The second novice knee jogger error is hanging off too far. Enough is helpful, too much is awkward and does more harm than good. Notice how stiff the rider is when off too far. One cheek off the seat is enough. These two simple rules will get you started. Hang off early and not too far. The opposite of hanging off is crossed up. This reduces control, exaggerates lean angle and makes the rider twisted and tight on the bike. With a hung off body position, control improves. Lean angle is decreased and the rider is in alignment with his bike and relaxed. Compare the two. With the speed and line almost identical, look at the difference in exit lean angle. Less lean equals more throttle and better drive. Now let's compare straight up riding with hanging off and see if there is a difference. Here he is riding straight up. Once again, at nearly identical speed and line, there is a measurable difference in lean. Body position on the bike can positively or negatively affect your riding. He could have gotten over sooner for this corner. Getting over before turning, he's smooth as silk entering the turn. Both errors here, moving over while turning, and he's off too far. The problem is compounded when you lose connection with the bike. He's remedied that. Now back up a bit. There he goes. His arms can now be loose and relaxed. When the whole body position and turn entry package is done right, it affords a rider the maximum of control with the absolute minimum of effort. Here's another view of a clean, loose run through a turn. The human machine works this way. When the lower body is unstable, we must rely on our arms and torso for support. Once the lower body is stable, we are at liberty to relax the torso and get great body position. Notice how much lower he can go without tension. Let's look at the difference between his moves on the bike when disconnected and compare that to locked onto the bike firmly. Much more relaxed and in control. The crossed up riding style looks even worse from on board. Everything about the rider is twisted and unnatural. Head, shoulders, even eye position is strained. One last look at the difference between riding crossed up and stiff on the bike and riding in alignment well connected and loose. It's easy to see how we can create instability with the bike. What design features do sport and sport touring bikes have to help prevent that? Why do sport bikes even look the way they do? High back seats anchor the rider more firmly, reducing the need to hang on by grabbing the bars too tightly. Large tanks help provide a better perch on the bike. Some riders use it for elbow or forearm rest during cornering. They can also provide a resting place for the upper torso. Knee cutouts on the tank side provide a more stable way to hold on, allowing the rider to use the bars less. Rear set foot pegs are really important. They give the rider a more stable perch for moving around on and steering the bike. If this bike had cruiser pegs like this, it would be unrideable. In fast turns, trying to anchor yourself firmly on the bike requires something to hold on to. Unfortunately, the inside bar is the handiest thing, resulting in the rider pulling on it. This makes the bike go to the outside of the turn because you are counter steering. 
Gripping the bike with one or both legs eliminates this problem. Resting an elbow on the tank can help. The hanging off style can have another unfavourable side effect. By pulling yourself from one side of the bike to the other using the bars, you will make the bike wiggle. Anchoring yourself firmly on the bike and using your legs to move reduces unwanted handlebar input and avoids the problem. Is a motorcycle truly out of control when it's sliding? How do you save it when the front or rear tyre gives up traction? Why don't the fast guys always crash when their bikes slide? While wiggles and shakes are distracting, there is a far more dramatic and deadly result from survival reaction number two. That's being too tight on the bike. This is the stable position for a front wheel during a slide. What would happen if the rider resisted this movement? When you counter the front end's natural attempt to stabilise the bike, you create resistance at the front contact patch, making the slide worse, and turning into high sides like this. While he may not be really fast yet, our new rider is making real progress. The three most common reasons for front end slides are one, over braking going into turns, two, from overloading the front tire. This is called pushing the front end. The standard solution to a pushing front end is getting back on the gas. And three, from slippery surfaces. Fighting the front will make you crash. Letting the bike do its own thing, relaxed on the bars, is the right choice. You are dangerous to yourself to the degree you let this survival reaction number two grip you in its claws. Take control by doing nothing. Let the bike stabilize itself. We can contribute to or detract from the bike's inherent stability by understanding its demands and eliminating any unwanted or unneeded inputs. Take braking. With the weight forward, stiff arms and up on the tank, the bike stoppies. With less bar pressure and the rider stabilised by the tank, the bike is more stable. Back in the seat with loose arms gives controlled braking. Even with severe lockup, control is much improved. An all too common error is twisting to the inside of the bike. He's trying to gain stability but creates tension. Even if you don't hang off the bike, stabilising your body is still important. Gripping the tank with one or both of your knees as you go into and through the turn is simple and efficient. The more firmly you anchor yourself, the easier it is to relax your torso and arms. For mid-corner, suspension is set up for a given amount of weight fore and aft. The bike cannot compensate for you moving around on it. As we've covered already, get into your fore and aft position on the seat early and stay there. Just to recap, your bike's suspension can be adjusted for a variety of road and track conditions. But you cannot adjust it for excess rider input. By being loose, the rider allows the bike suspension to perform at its best. The main points of rider input are Hanging off too late creates instability. Get over early. Hanging off too far creates instability as well. Being disconnected on the bike looks like this. Locked on is better. Twisted on the bike. Going with the bike. The seat provides stability and so does the tank. Use your pegs. Riding stiff. Riding loose. Using the bars to hold on. Using the tank. Tight equals front end shake. Loose is stable. Crossing on the bike. Going with it. Tight, it slides. Loose, it recovers. Acceleration head shake. Acceleration stability. Braking instability. 
locked on in the seat gives good braking stability. Stabilising the bike is the rider's goal in any corner. Throttle error or entering a corner too fast are two of our known enemies in getting that result. But perhaps the most important of all is your line through the turn. Having a poor line through any corner makes the rider's job of stabilising the bike with good throttle control all but impossible. We've already explored counter steering and know it gives us effective and precise control of the bike's direction. But there are three underlining principles to steering that you must understand. There are three tools we use for executing our line. One, where you begin the turn. Two, how quickly you flick the bike over. Three, how far you lean it. Let's investigate the first one, where you start the turn and see how it can affect your cornering. But what is the solution? What can you do to bypass these problems? The answer is too simple. Find and use a good turn-in point. Finding a turn-in marker and using it will give you consistency. It helps you avoid problems like inconsistent lines and throttle errors. How can you find a good line? Once you establish a reference point, the trial and error method will tell you what works and what doesn't. That tar snake on the pavement is a good reference point. He tries a later turn in, but that chops up his brake release. A little earlier runs him too wide and the throttle goes off and on. Right after it, he carves a clean line and, most importantly, the throttle control is great. He's taking an early turn in, resulting in an inside line. It's plenty fast coming in, but slower mid-turn and exit. Turning in later, trying to straighten out the turn, allowed him to get back on the gas earlier. Your entry point has a huge effect on overall corner speed. While the low inside entry had a high approach speed, it was slower mid-corner and exit. The higher outside turn entry allows him to point the bike more towards the exit. Even before mid-corner, he's back on the gas. Now let's look at how entry point affects braking. Your beginning and ending brake points are both modified by where you start your turn. On the low inside line, you're leaned over longer and brake pressure is critical because it's easy to lock up the front wheel. On the later turn entry, it's easier and safer because more braking is done with less lean angle and it most often is completed earlier, allowing the rider to get back on the gas. This is a huge difference. If the pavement was slippery, which line would you choose? Finishing the braking earlier or later? Your turning point determines that. Let's follow him in on the high line. He ends his braking just as he's flicking it in and he gets a better drive. By the way, even though it's usually a minor point, downshifting is another thing that is affected by where you turn in. Of the key tools of turning, one is how quickly you can get the bike over. It's easy to see how the early and later entries compare in this regard. The low entry requires lazy steering. You can't flick the bike onto its line. The later turning allows for a decisive steering commitment to the turn. Mid-corner and exit stability and speed start when the gas comes on. Watch both lines to see where the gas comes back on.
our later entry rider was able to get back on the gas 37 feet earlier. That's five bike lengths. Earlier on the gas means stability through more of the corner. Your turning position has an enormous effect on that. That's six points so far. A good drive off the turn is number seven. Low line entry checks your drive because number eight on the list, lean angle, also comes into play. You will lean over further and longer from a low line entry. Seeing a line that is taking you too wide does not inspire confidence. Seeing one that points you further up the road does. Number 10 is how much road you have at the widest point of your exit. On the street, the same principle applies. Staying in your lane through the middle and exit of the turn is all easier with a later entry point. This helps reduce panic and provides riders with a greater margin of error in regard to oncoming traffic. The eleventh and final aspect that is affected by our turn point is mid-corner lean angle correction. While they may seem like a fact of life, they're a common rider error that results from this same tech point. Early turn entry. Throttle control rule number one. The clean, continuous roll-on is always easier once you have established a workable turn point. The single biggest cause of SR number one, going off the gas when you should be rolling on, is a bad line. We now know all 11 aspects of your riding that are affected by your turning point. Let's quickly review them. One, where the brakes go on. Two, where the brakes go off. Three, where the throttle comes back on. Four, where the bike is pointed once fully leaned over. Five, where will you finish the turn? How wide will you run at the exit? Six, where will you downshift? Seven, how much lean angle will you use? Eight, how many, if any, steering corrections will you make? Nine, how quickly or slowly will you have to steer the bike? Ten, how much speed you can approach the turn with? 11. How quickly or slowly the throttle may be applied. Good. Those are the 11 things affected by your turning point. Now, let's look at how quickly you turn the bike and how that affects your cornering. How quickly do you need to turn? Not very quick in this situation. It would be silly to quick flick the bike when you don't need to. Here's the perfect flick rate. Being able to get a quick, clean flick has many advantages. How does the rate you flip the bike affect your line in any series of corners, like these S's? This rider's turn rate was too slow to get him on line to set up for the next corner. This rider makes the same approach, starts his turn at the same place and is running the same speed and with a quicker flick. His setup for the next turn is a perfect line and it will work exactly the same way for you. Since we don't like to run wide in turns, and for a very good reason in situations like this one, we must continue to lean the bike further and further to make the corner. Lazy steering forces you to lean the bike more than is necessary, and you'll be leaned over longer. Let's compare.
The quicker flick brings the bike onto the desired line. No extra lean needed. Look how much space he has on the outside of the turn. That would come in handy on the street, in an emergency, or on the track for speed. And look at the difference in acceleration. The approach speed and turning point for both riders was very similar. So what was the key difference that got this one through and put this one in the dirt? Let's look again. At this lazy steering rate, even if he leaned it over further, the results would have been the same, or worse. The simple solution is flicking the bike quick enough to make the line. Now what will happen when they increase their turn entry speed? His results would just get worse. With a higher entry speed than before, this rider still makes his line. It's quite simple. In turns like this, as the speed increases, so must your flick rate. The route to confidence with turn entry speed is nothing more or less than faith in your own ability to get the bike turned quick enough. Okay, we want to be able to turn the bike as quickly as possible for lots of reasons, like accident avoidance, to not run wide in turns or off the road, avoiding being late on the gas and adding excess lean angle. Not to mention, you'll get a better drive. How do we make this possible? How do you become efficient with your steering? What works and what doesn't work? The plane of rotation of the bars looks like this. At a steep angle like this, half your input into the bars goes straight down and is a total waste of energy. At this angle, you're still only 75% efficient. Here, your input is in line with bar rotation and is 100% efficient. This is another great example of how understanding the technology puts you in full control. A simple experiment will tell you if what I say is true or not. Get forward on the bike and position yourself directly over the bars and try to push the bike down into a lean. A lot of effort, but not much happens. All motorcycles work this same way. It's the horizontal rotation of the bars that gets the job done. A huge part of rider confidence is knowing you can quickly turn when you want to or need to. It's not about the kind of bike you ride, it's all about control. Some say flicking the bike too quickly is dangerous or makes the bike unstable. But done correctly, it is clean, smooth and efficient. Our two new riders have come a long way towards understanding how the bike steers and where to turn it. Their confidence to lean the bike more is a direct result of that. Riders who understand this both look and feel in control of their bikes. In double apex turns like this one, things can sometimes feel a little busy. Trying to maintain a continuous throttle roll-on only runs you wide, because it's really two turns. But the rider has more choices. Just roll the gas on a little bit and hold it there. Not horrible, but not really stable either. Get on the gas, and then off to turn it for the second part of the turn, then back to the gas. But that only chops it up, doesn't it? He could go in hard and brake a bit, then on the gas again. That could work, but you'd better be super smooth. OK, how do we do it? Timing is critical. Getting back into the throttle early stabilises the bike. Then, mid-corner, instead of rolling it off, he just stops rolling on. Here is where your body position comes into play in a big way. When you stop your roll-on, some weight transfers forward. If you are low and to the inside of the bike, it hooks around, tightening the bike's turning radius. That helps to get it pointed toward the exit without upsetting the bike. Look at how much earlier this rider is getting into his down and to the inside body position. Here we see an average hang-off position.
here's a more aggressive body position. Notice he's able to hold a tighter line. Now that's the hook turn technique and can work in almost any cornering situation. On the road, this technique can be used quite effectively if you find yourself running wide in a turn. Dropping to the inside and down position, plus a smooth roll off or momentary hesitation, not a chop off of the gas, tends to tighten the turn for you. And don't forget to look where you want to go. That's way better than the alternative. Here is a technique that can aid you greatly in your efforts to steer your bike accurately. We quite naturally push off or pivot from our trailing foot to produce maximum power and control. With that in mind, using the left leg to generate the power to press on the right bar and vice versa is a logical step. It provides the rider with maximum stability on the bike. Stability equals control and strength. As we lock our lower leg into the bike from the foot peg to the tank, we begin to create lower body stability. The next step is a slight tightening of the thigh muscles. This locks the pelvis in position, which then provides a stable base for the whole torso. With the torso stable, the rider's ability to apply pressure to the bars is vastly improved. We call this pivot steering. You might call it power steering, because once you master it, it feels so easy to steer the bike. Work on your quick turn. It pays huge dividends in control and confidence in any situation on any bike. Going where we look is an unfortunate survival reaction. In fact, it's SR number five. For example, if this rider looks at the inside of his next turn, he will go there. Once our attention becomes fixed on something, we steer towards it. In common parlance, it's called target fixation. And that's what causes riders to take too early an entry into corners, or run wide, like this. We already know what the results of turning in too early are. Training yourself to look in without turning in is how we overcome this SR. We call it the two-step technique. It's also the key to finding a line that doesn't take you in too early, even on unfamiliar roads. Your first step is to estimate a turning point on the road ahead. You don't know the road, so you're just establishing a temporary reference point. Step two is find your mid-corner position. Where you clip the inside of the turn is your apex. The trick here is looking in to find it without turning the bike in at the same time. Now he looks in, but notice how he is staying wide in the corner. Now, would you be able to see a line from this position? No. Keep looking, but don't turn yet. How about from here? Not yet, but it's getting better. OK, now you can see your apex clearly. That's exactly where your turn in point should be. Nothing provides more confidence than knowing you're on a good line, and it does wonders for your throttle control. Let's take a look and see if we can sort out his inconsistent lines. He ran pretty wide on that pass. Let's see how he is timing his look in and turn in. Big mistake. He's looking and turning. Now he's not running as wide, but it's another different line. The two-step visual technique solves more than just where to turn into a corner. It can also help with your consistency. In the end, your lines will only be as accurate and consistent as your visual skills. Knowing exactly where you want the bike to go before entering, using the two-step technique handles that. Applying the two-step technique allows the rider to gain space and time at the entry of the turn, to apex and pick up his next turn point accurately. Once you truly learn to lead with your head and eyes, you'll be able to enter all corners smoother, more accurately and, for track riding, usually faster. It's as good as it gets. Using the two-step turn entry technique also helps combat the look-in, go-in early SRs. By training yourself in this technique, you'll always be two visual steps ahead in every turn entrance. 
Hardbraking can be both confusing and terrifying. No other control action on the bike can produce such dramatic results with so little effort. Most riders' survival reactions run wild under heavy braking. Brake technology has come a long way. These improvements give riders far more choices on how to brake. But the laws of physics still govern how hard we can use them. Brakes, just like the throttle, are lean angle sensitive. The more lean angle you use, the less you can use either of them. This brings up all kinds of questions about technique. Should I do all my braking straight up? Or should I trail the brakes into the turn? Should I brake easy at first and hard at the end, or the other way round? How about easy, then hard, and then easy again? While braking, it's easy to lose sight of the real goal. Getting your turn entry speed perfect is that goal. With that in mind, which brake pressure sequence is best. Turn entry speed errors are easiest to make when you are hard on the brakes towards the end of braking. In the fine art of braking, gradually trailing the brake off is the way to accurately find your entry speed. Straight up or trail braking, it's the exact same problem. Maintain control of your entry speed. Over braking, SR number 7, often creates other problems like poor throttle control and extra steering corrections. Both unsettle the bike and can even cause excess wheel spin. Panic braking in the middle of turns is something we try to avoid because it stands the bike up abruptly. Unconsciously, we apply pressure to the bars to maintain our line. That additional input is one of the primary reasons for trail braking crashes. Restraining bar flutter does not let the front end follow the road, which reduces available traction even more. Despite its dangers and drawbacks, trail braking is a useful tool. Just imagine yourself leaning into a turn at 200 miles an hour with the brakes on like this. If you have to brake in a turn because of an emergency, like debris or a surprise decreasing radius, bringing the bike up as you do it is your best hope for not washing out the front end. Simultaneous braking and downshifting smooths things out and reduces distractions. This helps you get your turn entry speed right. Watch the timing of the clutch and throttle action in slow motion. Slipper clutches seem to make this unnecessary and modern electronics will probably make it an obsolete technique someday. Too bad, it's quite fun when you get it right the old-fashioned way. Riders come up with all sorts of strange variations to solve braking and downshifting. He's downshifting first and braking later. That's unnecessary engine abuse. Use the brake first. Pads are cheap, engines are expensive. Some just downshift and don't bother to use the brakes at all. In some situations, when brakes aren't needed, that's okay. But again, pads are cheap. Letting the clutch out slowly seems to solve it for some riders, but that's just extra wear and tear on the clutch and drivetrain. Here, he's revving the motor, but the clutch release is so slow he loses all the revs from his throttle blimp. Many riders use this sloppy method of downshifting. No revs at all and a slow release of the clutch. Getting too big a throttle blip over revs the motor and causes the bike to surge forward with each gear change. Another common error is over revving and varying the brake lever pressure from the exaggerated wrist movement. This is choppy and causes the bike to pogo. Too early downshifting uses the engine as a brake and over revs it. Not revving the bike between shifts and inconsistent brake pressure pogos the bike up and down. Here he's shifting and easing out the clutch slowly. That takes time and attention.
He's revving it, but too high, and still on and off the brake lever, pogoing the bike. Making clean downshifts and maintaining control of the brake lever throughout will help. Letting your fingers slide over the brake lever while you control the pressure works really well. Downshifting without the clutch is another way of handling it. Careful timing of the throttle blip and the gear lever makes it surprisingly easy and smooth, with or without a slipper clutch. It may take some practice to make them perfectly smooth. Traction is the obvious limiting factor on our speed and direction changes. We've explored how throttle control, rider input and surface problems can affect traction. But let's take a closer look. A new rider's perception of traction is a little sketchy. As we gain more experience with traction, our perception improves. There are some classical approaches to understanding traction used by average riders and pros alike. They can give riders a new perspective on tyre grip. It's a classic route to understanding traction. Here's Keith's solution to understanding traction. He calls it the lean and slide bike. About this time, most riders would chop the gas in panic. It takes a lot more to lose traction than most riders think, but there are situations you should be aware of. Of course, if the tire was new and not yet scrubbed in, or too old, too cold, uh, tire pressure was wrong, over or under inflated, if you were riding on a slippery surface or a polished surface, leaning the bike over too far, other mechanical problems, it would slide. The slide bike helps train riders to avoid slide errors. Watch what happens when he chops the gas. As we've already seen, when rolled off, not chopped, it is far less violent. Overriding the grip of new or cold tires is a classic novice riding error. Even at relatively modest lean angles and speed, a cool tire on a cool day can surprise you when you first go out. It doesn't take much to slide. Tire grip and temperature are proportional. A cold tire feels like it has maybe 25% its normal grip. A warm tire on a warm day feels more like 75% or more right away. Don't be a fool. Gradually bring the speed and the temperature up. Never trust the tires. Trust yourself. Learn to bring them up to temperature according to conditions. In generally good conditions, as we have here, modern tires deliver excellent traction. Good throttle control is the foundation that allows a rider to explore the limits of traction. Even with good throttle control, a small slide can start or get out of hand when the rider is tense. The rider's ability to be comfortable with traction limits depends upon having the key elements of throttle control, rider input and visual skill. Two other aspects of traction are important to understand. The more lean angle you use, the less side grip you have. The solution? Even when the rear tyre is totally lit up, bringing the bike up into the slide helps the rider maintain control. The lean and slide bike is one of the training methods used at Keith School to help riders gain that confidence and experience with traction. All seven factors, visual skills, steering, turn points, line, rider input, lean angle and picking up the bike must be under the rider's control for him to be confident with the throttle and with traction. New technology is great, but even with traction control and modern electronics, the rider has to work his way up to using it. 
fact, being in control of these seven factors is the quickest and easiest route to confidence.